Well, good evening. Uh, the normal opening is welcome, but I know everybody except one who I've just spoken to. Uh, but welcome anyway. Um, the first uh, item of business, so to speak, is just like going on the web to a, a website and you have to hear about the sponsors. Um, the sponsors, of course, is uh, Augustine College, and I need to say something about that, especially to those of you who are zooming in, um, because, as always, we need your support. The college is now approaching 25 years history. Um, it began in the University of Ottawa uh, five years or so before that, somewhere around, or a bit more perhaps, uh, the late 80s. And the reason it began uh, was providential. Uh, I met Graham Hunter, who incidentally was a speaker tonight. He, it was his, he was his choice for best man, so uh, uh, he ultimately ended up teaching philosophy at uh, Augustine College for a while. Uh, so we came into contact. Uh, we didn't know one another in the university, but Graham came to a talk I gave and said, you're free for lunch any time. Um, we found that we had the same interests. Uh, we both thought the university was a wonderful place. If you could get rid of the sports program, it would be perfect. And the students, too, would be a helpful loss. But uh, we never had a, a joy of the university we really wanted. Um, but we did, of course, like any academic, complain about the bureaucracy and the administration. The only department in the universities and medical schools that has grown dramatically in, the, in my lifetime is, of course, administration. And the benefits are, my son tells me, real, but I'm yet to be convinced. So we complained about the university. And in a few weeks, uh, I hope it was the Holy Spirit got on our case and said, you're not alone. And we thought, and we, we could think of a couple of others, and they thought of a couple more. So we invited them to our weekly lunch, and then it turned into a breakfast. Now... The good Lord had put an interesting group of people together. We had uh, Ernest Kaparos, who was John Paul II's canon lawyer. David Jeffrey, who I, I consider to be the best evangelical intellect on the continent, now at Baylor, ret just retired actually. Uh, Graham Hunter, the philosopher. Ed Blader, who uh, died uh, a month or two after giving his last lecture here, uh, just after Christmas just over 12 months ago, who was a classicist, uh, who's never seen a plinth that he didn't want to go and look at. Um, uh, we once went on a tour of Asia Minor with him, which was wonderful. His energy was amazing. Uh, I was the idiot in the group. Uh, a little later, uh, uh, we had a good philosopher, Edith Humphrey, who then went to Pittsburgh. Um, but there had to be somebody who talked about science. And, but the only problem with scientists, we don't know anything except science, and then only a small part of the whole. Because what happened was we rapidly realised that the average student going into a typical Western university, if they are Christian and virtuous and virgins when they go, are unlikely to be so at the end of a year. Uh, the university is corrosive for faith, uh, virginity, and thinking. The mind, too, is put into uh, brainwashing mode, especially at the moment with things like uh, critical race theory uh, popping up everywhere. We had no idea what to do. We realised that going to Bible school actually made it worse, not better, because they went to Bible school in an old-fashioned way and came back quoting Scripture as though everyone accepted the authority of Scripture, which the university doesn't. So all they did is make targets of themselves to people who were smarter than they were. That's not a good idea. So we decided we ought to read about education to see if we could come to some sort of sense of how we got into this mess. Um, we started reading with the Greeks and we got all the way to Alistair MacIntyre. Um, during that process, we realised what was happening. Even we were not thick enough to repel the borders, so to speak. 
We, we used to meet in a greasy spoon restaurant on King Edward, and very quickly graduate students started sitting at the next table, and they weren't talking. They were listening to us. So we said, you might as well join us. And we had up to 30 people turning up. No paper trail, no advertising. Even the, someone from the CBC came, people from Parliament Hill. Um, I still meet people who uh, were at that reading group. The best seminar I have ever attended in my life. Uh, we once counted 29 languages around the table. Um, I met the lady who, who contributed 10 of them, and hopefully she's going to come and take part in Augustine College. Now she's back in the Ottawa area, uh, an amazing linguist. But homeschooling moms and dads and the graduate students said, you need to do something about it. And we realized that what people needed to know was how things came to be as they are. In other words, a history of how ideas might be generated in one area of learning and end up deeply influencing another and vice versa. So it's not really a history of ideas program because it, it's, it's entire, entirely directed uh, biased uh, to making it clear to young people who have a faith that they are not stupid. Uh, we intend to send students away more confident in their faith. We're not into the business of making sceptics. Uh, we all have enough scepticism and cynicism to go around anyway. But we are in the business of truth. Uh, and it has been astonishing. Uh, we have still to reach 300 students, I think. We must be getting close now over the whole time. But that's all. Our average, I think, is 12.5. It may have dropped a bit over the last year or so, and this, this year and probably next we're going to drop it a bit more. But that's beside the point. The incredible phenomenon is that alumni keep in touch with us. Now, I went to an excellent school. I had a very good training in medicine. I've been back to the medical school once. I never went back to the school. Although I owe these institutions, I've never done that. But people come back to visit us whenever they get the chance, and they keep in touch with one another. They support one another. Uh, and we have approximately a 10% probability that you've met your spouse when you're here. You may not know it for a while, but that happens. And what better way could there be than to enjoy one another's minds before you think about bodies? So lots of things are being done right. Um, the only problem is we are not managing to persuade the world that they should come. Uh, alumni try, we all try. Um, I have the, the most opportunity to do that. And so what I've discovered is that I need a weekend with a family that's got kids there. And if I get a weekend, and they're not yet pubertal, in other words, the hormones haven't yet started to play havoc with their minds, uh, they might make the decision they'll come, and they're likely to do so. But particularly in the next year uh, or so, we need many of you who are zooming in to seriously think about whether you can make a sacrificial gift towards keeping this going. Um, it's important. I, I don't know of another program like it, uh, Reno, Rusty Reno, the editor of First Things, says he doesn't either. And every now and again he writes a nice comment about us because we are cheap, very cheap. If we could have enough money to give scholarships more, that would make it even better. Uh, and you go on to good things because it's a good training for your mind. So that's the advertising splurge. Uh, I hope it reaches your heart as well as your mind. Uh, that's for those who online primarily. We do have a summer program which has been a, a wonderful uh, gift to us financially because it's for doctors and they have disposable cash. Uh, but we discovered last year that more of them come when we Zoom, but they give us less. So face-to-face -face has got something to be said for it. Now, we get on having done the advertising bit to the more important bit. Uh, speaker tonight, Christopher Byrne, I think we could have a good heated discussion at some point with no holds barred and no bad feelings of any sort. Um, because he's a classicist and an Aristotelian and I'm deeply sceptical about Aristotelian science. So I love his biology, but I don't love his physics. 
Um, and certainly I didn't love his medicine or anyone else's till. 1850 was the first time when it was a good idea to go to the doctor rather than not go to the doctor. So it took a long while for medicine to have anything to show for it. Um, he, like me, went off to university and uh, got a bit lost at one stage, although he got lost in nice places like Heidelberg. That was a, that was a clever move. Uh, I, I didn't get to do that. I, should, I didn't think I would, didn't know about such things. Um, so he's a bona fide uh, philosopher, educated first in PPE at uh, Toronto for his undergraduate and then went to Heidelberg uh, for an MA. Uh, he must have worked because he got a first class honours and then uh, another MA uh, at the University of Toronto and then finally a PhD uh, also in Toronto. Uh, he's taught most of his time at St. Ibex uh, on the East Coast, a lovely place, sort of, to me, it's like going back a century in, in the very best way. So I'm envious of spending 30 years there, and I'm very much looking forward to what you've got to say to us tonight. Please feel very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the college for the invitation to speak with you this evening, and uh, um, I understand that there are also others uh, zooming in, so uh, greetings to those out in the virtual land. Um, my, oh, and thanks very much as well to the staff here at Augustine College for organizing this, particularly um, Mr. Paul Kromberg, who uh, not only uh, did all the technical stuff on this, but also came up with the poster for this talk. And uh, you may have noticed uh, on this poster, there's a whole series of uh, ancient philosophers with their noses broken off, and then right beneath it is my picture, and you'll see that I fit right in. Um, so I want to talk about the ancient Greeks uh, this evening. Um, sometimes when we think about the ancient Greeks, it's what's different about them that attracts us, in particular in the area of their art and architecture. There's a distinctive ancient Greek way of doing things, and something we admire, to some extent imitate, but it's a way of doing things that, that we sort of identify as distinctively Greek. But also, I think, in the area of philosophy, mathematics, and I would argue natural science, it's not so much the way in which they're different as the way in which they're the same as us that attracts us. My students regularly are struck when they're reading works by the ancient philosophers and how contemporary the discussion is, that this is the debate that could be taking place um, just as easily today as it was back then. Uh, indeed, let me give you an example. So here we are in Ottawa. You all know what a philosophical city Ottawa is. <laughs> this is a place where matters of great import are debated and decided. So imagine you're walking along Metcalf Street just outside, and uh, another one of these you philosophical interlocutors accosts you and says the following. If you want to understand human nature, you have to look at what people do, not at what they say. Their behavior is the best indication of their true beliefs. It's in their behavior that people reveal their true preferences. And when you look at human behavior, what you discover in the first instance is an enormous variety of patterns of conduct, rules and norms, and so forth. So we're struck by the diversity of human practices, an enormous variety. But underlying that diversity, in fact, there is a fundamental similarity. If you look at the norms and rules and laws and standards, not only around the world today, but in the past, you will discover that there's a pattern that shows up again and again. And that pattern is as follows that however diverse these rules and norms may be, the rules are always made to the advantage of the rule makers. The laws vary from place to place and time to time, as do the rulers. But the laws always have this much in common, that they're made to the advantage of those who are politically stronger. The people who make the laws make them to their own advantage. Now, you may bemoan this, but in fact, there is no higher standard of justice to which you could appeal to say that this set of rules or this set of laws is just and that set of rules is unjust. 
There's just power, just the relations of power. And everywhere, as I said, that you look, you will find that power is always exercised in the same way, namely to the advantage of the powerful. Now just consider for a moment that argument. Is that something that you, it's perhaps something you would find in a modern author, somebody like Michel Foucault, or perhaps in the 19th century German philosopher, classicist, classicist Friedrich Nietzsche, or perhaps earlier, it sounds a bit like Hobbes' description of the state of nature where everyone is everyone else's enemy. But in fact, those of you who know Plato's Republic, as soon as I said that justice is everywhere to the advantage of the politically stronger, would right away would have recognized the speech of Thrasymachus in the first book of Plato's Republic. Now Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are going to offer an alternative to that account of justice and morality that is radically different from Thrasymachus' view. But I just wanted to start by indicating that the alternative they offer that I'm going to talk about this evening is made fully aware of the fact that there is this, this alternative account, what you might call, I suppose, in common parlance, the cynical account. Right? The justice is everywhere, the rule by the strong to the advantage of the strong. That's not true, according to Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, but it's a tough argument that they have to make. Now, um, as I say, I'm struck, and my students are repeatedly struck, by the modernity of that argument. That it's an argument that people make today and have made many times in the past. And so what I want to talk about this evening is what the ancients have to say in response to modernity. So I'm going to begin by talking a bit about what, how, what I understand modernity to be, in particular the version of it, the iteration of it that we face today. And then I'm going to say something about what Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle have to say in response to that, what they take to be the problems, and then perhaps conclude by thinking a bit about what they might have to say to us today. All right, so what do I mean by modernity? Modern societies typically see themselves as superseding a pre preceding society that they have sort of their, their ancestors, if you will, but they look on their ancestors, however illustrious they may be, they look on their ancestors as people who are deeply ignorant about the true nature of the world. Right? They may have accomplished many, many things, but they were fundamentally misguided and mistaken about the, the nature of reality, about the way things really are, and what's actually going on in the world. In our case, um, this particular way of thinking about modern society began in the scientific revolution of the 17th century, but it is principally the product of the enlightenment of the 18th century, which is a time at which people thought about the implications of this new scientific revolution. What does it teach us about nature? What does it teach us about the nature of physical reality? And what are the implications of that um, morally and politically? And these three claims, I think, are at the heart of the modern understanding of the world. First of all, what you might call reductive materialism. So the argument here is very straightforward. To be, in the primary sense of the term, is to be a material body or the property of a material body. Matter is the fundamental substratum of what's real. Everything else depends upon matter to exist. And things are, not just are the way they are, but they behave the way they do because of the matter from which they are made. So the tables before you, the instruments around us, and so on and so forth, these are all material objects. And if you want to understand what they are, how they behave, particularly their causal capacities, you have to look at the matter from which they're made. Matter is what's most real, and matter explains everything else. The second characteristic modern belief, I think, follows from this. If to be in the primary sense of the term is to be a material object, to be something physical, then you may have noticed about matter that there is nothing about matter that is moral. There is nothing about matter in and of itself, nothing about physical bodies in and of themselves that are good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust. Bodies have all sorts of properties such as extension and shape and size, mass, and so on and so forth, but not good or bad. Which means, then, if we're going to have standards of human conduct, 
we're going to have to find them somewhere else. And in the first instance, we're going to have to find them in ourselves because something else about which we are convinced is real is ourselves, our own desires, inclinations, and appetites. They too seem to be inescapably real. And so whatever standards of conduct that we're going to have or find will not be found in nature, won't be found in the material world. So we're going to have to find our standards of conduct somewhere else. And that means in the first instance that we're going to have to make them up. So on this view, the standards, moral standards, are not grounded in the natural order. They're grounded in our legislative activity, self-legislative activity, in which we agree amongst ourselves as to what the rules are going to be. And so in that sense, the rules are fundamentally the product of common consent. We have to agree amongst ourselves as to what the rules are going to be. And in that sense, we agree about the, the rules of morality pretty much in the same way that we agree about the rules of the road. So here in Canada, we drive on the right-hand side of the road. In other parts of the world, people drive on the left-hand side of the road. That's just the local convention. It's what people have agreed to do. And so on this account, that's what the, sta the standards of morality are very much like the rules of the road. They're the set of norms that we have agreed to be bound by, that we have, as it were, legislated to ourselves. And finally, on this view, society as well, it's not just the standards of morality, but society itself, and in particular, our institutions, the institutions by which we govern ourselves, the laws, they too are the product of human making. They are artificial. We make them. If you will, on this account, to put it in perhaps more contemporary language, all standards of morality and justice are socially constructed. And I emphasize that term because some people think that the view that ethics and the standards of moral conduct are socially constructed and the laws and the rules of our political institutions socially constructed, some people identify that with postmodernism. It's not. This is one of the standard beliefs of the modernist view. If you look at the, for example, the, the, the perhaps the best known social contract theorists uh, of the 17th and 18th century, uh, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau, they're quite clear about this. Prior to our agreement and our consent to the rules, there is nothing right or wrong. Just as there is no fact of the matter about whether one should drive on the right hand or the left hand side of the road, prior to some legislative decision. So too on this view, prior to us deciding that murder, rape, theft, and so on and so forth are immoral or unjust, prior to our decision to that effect, there is no fact of the matter about this. All right? So we make the rules, and we can make them any way we want, but typically then we're going to make them to our own advantage in our self-interest. There is certainly, self-interest certainly does dictate that we have such rules, just as it's extremely useful to have a law that says you drive on the right-hand side of the road or you know what side of the road you're supposed to drive on. The carnage on our highways is bad enough. Imagine what it would be if any particular day you got up and you didn't know what side of the road you had to drive on. So it's very useful to have such rules and norms. Right? They are very useful to us. But in terms of what those rules are, this is entirely up to us. This is simply a matter. These are artificial constructions um, that are the product of our mutual agreement grounded in our self-interest. All right. Now, my contention is that this kind of intellectual evolution, beginning with the scientific revolution and then thinking through the implications of this scientific revolution, this is already happened, we've already been here once before. And so ancient Greece also had its own scientific revolution in the sixth and fifth centuries BC, where this brand new way, excuse me, of thinking about the world, in particularly a fundamentally materialist way of thinking about the world, became dominant. And then in the fifth century, the 400s BC, people had to think through, all right, what does this new understanding of nature mean? What are the implications of this new materialist account of the natural order? And so again, one sees these three fundamental beliefs come into the fore in ancient Greece. And so again, this modernist view that we in this modern period, so here are the ancient Greeks 
of the 4th and 5th century BC, looking back to a prior illustrious civilization, the Homeric world, where the, the, the stories of the Homeric gods told in Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Right? What you see there on the right is a kind of artist recreation of the statue of Zeus in the temple at Olympia, where the Olympic Games took place, which is on the Peloponnese, not up in the north at Mount Olympus, but Olympia in, in, in the Peloponnese. And there was a temple dedicated to Zeus there. And this is a kind of artist recreation of what that statue would have looked like. And just to give you some sense of the scale of it, at the very bottom in the middle are two life-size human beings. So it would have been an enormous, enormous temple and statue. So there's the old view that nature is ruled by the Olympian gods. But what does the new view say? That nature is ruled or controlled by matter. And so we go from Zeus, as represented in this picture, controlling nature, to this. This is what nature really is, All right? the swirl. Now, I mention the swirl in particular because this is roughly what the ancient atomists argued is the basic mechanism of nature. So on the ancient atomist view, they're the, the names of Leucippus and Democritus, on their view, nature consists of atoms moving in the void. All right? And these bodies move through empty space, they collide, they move in different directions. And on their account, atoms are not like billiard balls, they're not perfectly round, but they have, as it were, um, surface texture to them. And so what sometimes happens is these bodies collide and then sort of um, can hook up, connect to one another. And they aggregate and aggregate and aggregate. And what happens is you get a pattern like this developing where the heavier bodies get moved to the middle and the lighter aggregated bodies move further out. So this is fundamentally, this is the basic mechanism of nature. Atoms colliding, connecting, disaggregating and aggregating, moving through, through the void. All right. And interesting enough, um, um, Isaac Newton in the 17th century was very interested in ancient Greek science. And in one of his unpublished letters, he actually attributes the principle of inertial motion to the ancient Greek atomists. Um, as he understood them, what was going on between the collisions between the bodies was rectilinear inertial motion. Okay. Um, some of you may say, well, what about the swerve? Not the swirl, but the swerve. You may be familiar with Epicurus and Lu uh, Lucretius's account in the second century AD. This is not part of the original Adamus picture. Right? So there's a swirl, but not a swerve. And this is, as I say, this is sort of the basic mechanism of nature on the ancient Adamus account. Okay? So we go from that, we go from that, Zeus to that, the vortex. So that's the first one, this, this kind of reductive materialism. The second view that you'll find also in ancient Greece is this view about the origins of our moral beliefs. Again, as we've said on this view, there is nothing good or bad, just or unjust, right or wrong by nature. That would be a category mistake. It doesn't make sense to talk about bodies in motion as good or bad, or right or wrong, or what have you. And so again, we have to look somewhere else for our moral standards. And again, we find them in ourselves and in the satisfaction of our individual desires. All right. And that's really what underlies this notion attributed to Pythagoras, speaking on behalf of the sophists, that man is the measure of all things. We measure what is right or wrong because nothing else could. How could matter measure what is right or wrong there's nothing about matter that is right or wrong, just or unjust, or that could found anything like our moral beliefs. So we then are the, the originators of all of our moral standards, and we make them to suit our individual desires, and collectively then we do what is in our collective self-interest. And then finally, with respect to laws, human institutions, the political sphere, right? Obviously, on this account, our laws have no divine or indeed natural origin or foundation. They are, as we would say, socially constructed. They are simply the products of human making. They're artificial conventions. They exist only by agreement. So just as driving on the right-hand side of the road is the right thing to do here in Canada, only because we've agreed 
that that's the right thing to do. So too, on this view, all of our political as well as moral standards exist only by agreement. Right? And if it weren't for that agreement, there would be nothing right or wrong, just or unjust. By the way, I don't know if you recognize the statue there of the goddess of justice. She's standing less than a kilometer from here in front of our Supreme Court building up on Wellington Street. Um, you can perhaps tell that this is a Canadian representation of the goddess of justice. Ordinarily, she stands there with the scales in one hand and the sword in the other. But since this is Canada, the goddess of justice is sort of apologizing for, you know, bringing you up before the court and sword, what sword? No, no, there's no sword, no violence to be done here. And scales, no, nobody's going to be judged. <laughs> uh, it's all going to be nice. All right, so our laws and institutions then exist simply by agreement. So that's where Socrates comes into the picture. Socrates is facing, if you will, his own modernist turn. And what is he going to say in response to these earlier views? And I've just put some dates up here just to emphasize the notion we tend to think, when we think of the ancient Greek philosophers, we tend to think of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and we see them as somehow starting things. That was not their view. On their view, they're sort of Johnny-come-lately to the philosophical scene. As you can see, um, by the time Thales dies, around 546, it's not another 80 years until Socrates is born in 466 um, BC. If you look from Thales' birth, to Arist in, in 640 to Aristotle's death in 322. That's over 300 years. All right? Indeed, one of my favorite passages in Aristotle is where he refers to the earlier philosophers, or the earlier Greek philosophers, as ancients. All right? So Aristotle is, for us, one of the sort of quintessential ancient philosophers. Aristotle thought, no, 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 I'm a modern philosopher. The ancient philosophers, those were those guys who went several years, came several hundred years before me, all right? So Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are not beginning the philosophical tradition. They're responding to an earlier one. Since we're talking about Socrates, I cannot forbear from showing you the, the very well-known painting by the 18th century uh, French painter Jacques-Louis David. Here's his representation of the death of Socrates. It's not entirely accurate because those of you who, those of you, you who know um, Plato's Phaedo, know that Socrates' last words were a joke. Um, he was ironic to the end. He says to his followers, don't forget to offer a cock to Asclepius, which would be a bit like us saying um, uh, uh, to our, <laughs> our doctor involved in dying, thanks for the cure. All right. And again, since we're talking about the ancients, I cannot forbear from showing you another painting that's well known to you, Raphael's account uh, p depiction of the School of Athens. And at the center, you can see the detail there are Plato and Aristotle. OK. Oops. So um, as I understand them, Plato and Aristotle, inspired, if you will, by Socrates, see themselves as making a correction to what has gone before them. All right? and. It's important to, 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 to recognize that it's a correction, not a complete rejection. Right? So as I understand them, what they're saying is that this new science and philosophy are incomplete. They have part of the truth, but only part of the truth. They have, if you will, mistaken the part for the whole. In particular, the mistake they made was thinking about certain things that are necessary and thinking that they're sufficient. Let me try to illustrate this. And, and, and so I'm I want to emphasize that on their account, it's not that matter doesn't matter. It's not that self-interest and consent don't matter and aren't important, indeed aren't in some sense necessary. Right? But it's not the whole truth. And indeed, on their view, can't be the whole truth. So let's think about then this first view, the relationship between nature and matter. So on the earlier view, um, this sort of reductive physicalism, the, art, the idea is that if you want to understand any anything that exists by nature, indeed any perceptible object whatsoever, you look at the stuff, the physical stuff from which it's made. Right? Matter not only constitutes perceptible objects, matter also explains everything there is to understand about material objects and perceptible objects. And their response is to say, no, perceptible objects are typically composite things. 
They're not just matter. They're matter which is organized in a certain way. To use Aristotelian language, they have to be understood as composites of matter and form, or a material cause and a formal cause. And that's important because, to the third point there, the things around us, the perceptible objects around us, typically have their distinctive causal capacities only by virtue of having both the right kind of matter and the right kind of form. All right? We typically understand perceptible objects in terms of how these things behave, what kinds of distinctive causal capacities they have. But their claim is that these distinctive causal capacities belong to them not simply by virtue of their matter. That matter needs, in addition, this formal, this form or formal principle. And the easiest way to illustrate this is with artifacts. So I'm told that on YouTube there is someone who's made something of a name for himself by showing what he can do with an industrial strength blender. So blend it. And so he takes various and sundry household items, you know, a cell phone, and sticks it in a blender and blends it. And lo and behold, once a cell phone has been blended, I didn't know this, it doesn't work. You can't use it to do all the things that cell phones do once they've been blended. And the same thing is true with cameras and laptops. And I won't um, do it here for fear that uh, I use up the, the college's microphone, but you get the point. Artifacts typically can only do what they do, have their distinctive causal capacities, by virtue of being organized in a certain way. They require a certain kind of structure in order to be able to have these causal capacities. And without that form as well as the matter, they are impotent to do what they do as artifacts. And Aristotle and Plato argued the same is true of natural things. They too have to be understood as composites of matter and form. The matter is necessary, but not sufficient for these things to be able to behave the way they do. So matter is not enough. With respect to nature and the good, the argument is that yes, there are things that are good by nature, but not at the level of matter. So they agree with the pre-Socratic materialists that matter in and of itself is neither good nor bad, neither right nor wrong, just nor unjust. But since nature is not exhausted by matter, since we also have to think about natural things as composite objects, right, it's at the level of these functionally organized composite objects that we do find good and bad, right and wrong, functional and dysfunctional. Right? So we can apply terms like good and bad to these composite objects insofar as they are capable of performing their distinctive job or task or function properly. So goodness on this account in the first instance means functional excellence, being something being good at its job. Right? And again, the claim is this is not just true of artifacts. It's clearly true of artifacts. Right? We talk about cell phones and computers and so on and so forth, functioning or malfunctioning, right? doing whatever it is they do well or poorly. But again, the claim is this can also be applied to natural things, including living things. And in particular, it can be applied to human beings. And on this account, if you want to understand human beings, you have to think about them in terms of their distinctive causal capacities, and in particular, the way in which their distinctive causal capacities are deployed in getting done the jobs, the tasks, or functions that we all have to perform simply as human beings, and where we need certain skills or virtues, to use an old-fashioned term, that we require in order to perform those jobs or tasks or functions properly. And what are they? So on this account, then, as human beings, we have certain jobs to do. And we really don't have much choice in the matter. We have to look after our material needs. We have to think about our physical security. We have to think about cultivating our minds, educating ourselves. We have to think about companionship. On this account, human beings are naturally social animals. Right? We naturally aggregate with other human beings. Right? We have to think about the rearing of children and care for the vulnerable. So certainly the first four as individuals, we all have to get these jobs done, and all six of them as a society. These are jobs that we have to get done. And in order to do them properly, 
they claim, there are certain skills that we need, and these are the, the virtues that we require as human beings, because these are jobs that we have to do as human beings, not just as doctor, lawyer, teacher, what have you, but these are jobs we have to do simply by virtue of being a human being. You're a human being, here are the jobs you have to do. And in order to perform those jobs properly, you're going to need certain skills. Without the requisite skills, you're just going to make a hash of it. So what do you need in order to satisfy your material needs? Moderation, self-control, if you will. Security, courage. Cultivating our minds, wisdom. Companionship, what sort of virtues do we need to have in order to be good friends? We need loyalty and justice. Rearing of children, any of those, any of you have any experience with this? Patience and caring for the vulnerable. Compassion. And on their account, we really have no choice about this. Right? We are free, to, I suppose, to the extent that we can acquire the requisite skills or not. But we really don't have any choice in the matter with respect to these are the jobs we need to do and these are the skills we need to do them correctly. The only thing that's really up to us is whether we do these jobs well or poorly, that is to say, acquire the virtues we need to do them. And finally, with respect to the third area of inquiry, political society, the claim here is that contrary to the modern view, human beings are naturally social beings. Right? Any of you are familiar with the social contract theories of the 17th and 18th century, the claim is, is that we must begin with human beings as individuals, not in society. If you want to know what's natural about us, don't look at us in society. All right? Society is artificial and distorts our true nature. You want to find out what we really are, take us one at a time. Now, obviously, there are things about us that you can only find out taking us one at a time. Our temperature, our height, our weight, and so on and so forth. But on this view, if you only look at human beings individually, you will miss part of their nature, the social part of their nature. All right? And we, not only are we social, naturally social animals, there are certain common goods that we have. And indeed, the common goods, the, the goods, if you will, that bind us together are precisely laid out in that list of tasks that I indicated to you. We all have an interest in getting these jobs done and getting them done properly. So there really is something there. There are goods, fundamental goods there that we can share with one another that are an expression of our social nature. And if you look at those um, tasks, all of them are better done socially and indeed, in the case of, of companionship, necessarily involve other people. And indeed, on Aristotle's account, if you want to sort of get proof for how naturally social we are, he says the, the, the sort of the, the culmination of our social nature is expressed in friendship. He thinks this is kind of the crown of our social nature, but on his view, friendship requires, as I said, justice and loyalty. Right? Only virtuous people are capable of friendship. But a life without friends would be a miserable existence on their account. Okay. All right. So uh, we are naturally social beings. Sure, there's something, not, there's something artificial about laws. Right? Some people drive on the right-hand side of the road. Some people drive on the left-hand side of the road. There's a lot about our customs and so on and so forth that really are just artificial conventions. Right? But on this view, it's natural for us to have conventions. Just as it's natural for human beings to make tools and to construct things, so too on this view, it's natural for human beings to regulate their dealings with one another by law, by moral norms, by political standards. Because it's natural for us also not just to form societies, but to form political communities. Right? Short of that, our lives are incomplete. And so in this sense, we should not think about nurture as what's artificial and as something that is unnatural or contrary to nature. On this view, it's natural for us to nurture ourselves, to educate ourselves, to institute laws and legislate and so on and so forth. Language is a good example of this. Languages exist by convention, right? The vocabulary, the grammar rules that, that make sp speech intelligible, all of these are all artificial conventions. We can change them at will, right? But that doesn't mean that language is unnatural to us. 
On the contrary, on this view, it's natural for human beings to speak. How we do so, how we communicate with one another, of course that's a matter of convention. But that we do so, they think, is natural. So it's natural for us to have artifacts and tools and houses and all these other sorts of things and constructed things like languages. Without them, uh, our lives again would be incomplete. So if that's the case then, what's the problem with the modern view, both the modern view as expressed by the ancient, the pre-Socratic materialists and the modern view that sort of came to the, came to be, became dominant at the end of the Enlightenment in the 18th century, the view that is pretty much taught in our universities today. Well, first of all, with respect to the claim about the reductive physicalism, the argument again simply here is that it is not true that nature can be exhausted simply by matter. One way of thinking about this is if it were the case that everything about nature could be explained simply in terms of matter, then we would only need one science, physics. Physics is the science of matter. And if that's all there is, then you only need physics. Well, you might need a few philosophers to explain the physics to everybody else, but in terms of the scientific inquiry, you wouldn't need any other science. Right? But yet, at least the physicists and biologists that I talk to say that no, the biologists really do know something that physicists don't, which is to say biological organisms are real and have properties and causal capacities of their own. There's something there that cannot be understood simply by looking at the matter from which they're made. And you can then see where this notion of goodness in terms of functional excellence comes in because, of course, that's just what health is. Right? Health is a property of biological organisms to the extent that they are very roughly functioning properly. Right? The matter of biological organisms is not healthy, but we quite routinely think of biological organisms as being healthy or unhealthy, and we think we're describing something real. Second, on the modernist view, the highest moral principle is do no harm. Right? After all, that's why we have morals not so as not to be harmed by one another. All right. But the problem there is if the notion of what counts as a harm is to be defined by us individually, then you end up with an infinite number of harms. Everyone has their own list of things that they want defended. All right. And if the list gets very, very long, then very quickly your system of laws and norms falls apart. You cannot follow an infinitely long list of norms and laws. Although by now, given the number of regulations our governments have, we must be getting pretty close to that. All right? But there have got to be certain things that we agree on, certain common goods that we all agree to defend. But if all of this is self-defined and grounded in self-interest, right, on this view, the, the idea is, is that ultimately we won't be able to aggregate our individual interests in such a way that we can agree on things. As a thought experiment, I always used to ask my students, imagine as an exercise in getting people to agree on anything, just think of the last time you tried to order a pizza with any of your pals. Of course, the problem immediately arises as to what the toppings are going to be. Right? Now, just get a few people who are your good friends to agree on what the toppings of your pizza are going to be, and you see right away the, the, the problem. I'm told that there are even people out there who like pineapple on their pizza. How could anybody live with such a person? <laughs> All right. So aggregating individual desires is a difficult thing. Now you might say, oh sure, we're never going to agree on pizza toppings, but surely we can all agree on, I don't know, saving life. Well, do we? Under what conditions? Perhaps not. And so on. And, and how this is to be implemented and so on and so forth. The problem is simply this, is that the social contract will only work if it is based on a common good. Right? People have to agree that there is some good there that they have in common that they all benefit from. After all, that's why you sign up, or that's why you sign on the dotted line in the social contract, because it is supposed to be advantageous for you to do so. And we don't want to run into a situation such as described by Thrasymachus, where we're just being taken advantage of by the politically stronger. If it's just by consent and agreement and we see that we're just being taken advantage of, then walk away. Right? And indeed, on their view, that, that's a problem, a constant problem, this sort of securing of a common good. Um, on this view, 
uh, to the third point here, is that the social contract view really cannot sustain in a lasting way uh, a shared version of the sh shared vision of the common good. All right. So in the long run, the claim here quite simply is, is the modernist view does not provide a, a stable foundation for a lasting political moral community. Now, just let me close by illustrating this, some of the problems that arise from this, and um, take something that you're familiar with, uh, the modern universities. And by modern university, I'm thinking roughly of the universities since the middle of the 19th century. I say since the middle of the, the 19th century because on this list here of, of um, goals that I think uh, modern universities subscribe to, obviously the, one of the ones that's missing is religious, a religious education. And uh, um, pretty much looking at the history of the universities, my view would be pretty much since the middle of the 19th century, any kind of religious education has been moved to the periphery, if not eliminated altogether from modern universities. One might say that the modern universities made room for science, science moved in and religion moved out. Even as it is though, modern universities have multiple goals. And I'm speaking now to the extent that they understand themselves collectively. Of course, modern universities in a way are hard to understand because they're so complex. Um, I like to compare the modern universities to the Holy Roman Empire at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War in 1618, where there was nominally an emperor who ran the Holy Roman Emperor em Empire, but underneath that were several hundred large and small principalities all feuding constantly with one another. Right? And so the modern university is characterized by hundreds of institutes and departments and programs and so on and so forth, all of which are co constantly jockeying for resources and suspicious of one another. Nevertheless, you can find, I think, roughly these three goals um, uh, instantiated in their, in their, at least in their official pronouncements. First of all, obviously, the scientific mission of the university. So to instruct the students in the latest results and methods of the empirical sciences. All right. This is probably the most expensive part of the university as well. Second, liberal education, an education in the best of human accomplishment, regardless of time, place, and origin. And then finally, a third goal the universities have for themselves is civic education, preparing the young to become citizens, good citizens of the regime. All right? Now, in my view, in my time in the university, I think it's fair to say that the liberal education has been pushed, has also been pushed to the periphery. And as I understand what's going on now, I think it's the civic education that is looming larger and larger. But there is a problem with how universities understand their civic mission in terms of training young people to be good citizens. Inasmuch as there are typically three claims made about, and you'll see the connection to what I was talking about before in terms of modernism. First of all, the understanding is, is that as citizens, in the first instance, you are free. Right? And so we try to provide the maximum space for individual expression and self-expression. We maximize choice, freedom of choice, in as many areas as possible. So that is part of what you were trying to preserve and guard, your freedom of choice, get you to think of yourselves as free agents. Second is the diversity of human interests and abilities. Right? And you've all spent time in classrooms. Any teacher who's stepping into a classroom very quickly will tell you that there's enormous range of abilities and interests amongst people in any classroom, certainly in secondary or post-secondary institutions. So we see an enormous range, diversity, variety of interests and abilities. But third, now to, that today very quite prominently is the view that the outcome of all of this should be as much as possible equality. Right? That people come in, they get an education, but the outcomes of receiving that education, as much as possible, should be at the, end, at the end of the day, people have more or less equal wealth, income, social standing. So just think about that for a moment. On the one hand, you're entirely free. Right? You, there's a great diversity of abilities and interests. And then what would the expected outcome of that be? Well, if people are free to do as they wish, and they have a great 
variety or the differences in their abilities and interests, then you'd expect there be a, to be a great diversity in outcomes. Free people with diverse interests and abilities, you'd expect diversity of outcomes, which is indeed what we observe. Right? What we don't observe as a result of that is equality of outcome. And so it's, it seems to me that there's a kind of inner, if not contradiction, at least incompatibility in this understanding of what a good citizen is. It's that you are free to exercise your, your rights, which, which preserve your freedom, and you will do so in a way that reflects this enormous variety of interests and abilities. But at the end of the day, the outcome has to be one in which people more or less have the same outcome, the same result. All right. Um, that, I think, won't work. And so what would the ancients say about this? And so here, let me bring this to a close. What would the ancients say about this? On the view that I've set out, the, the, sort of the Socratic, Platonic, Aristotelian view, first of all, with respect to our freedom, our independence. So if you think about human beings and human conduct with respect to freedom, independence and dependence on one another, they tend to vary along a spectrum. Right? When we're infants, we're tremendously dependent on others, then we gain a certain independence, and then <laughs> as we get older, perhaps go back to being more dependent on others again. All right? If human beings really are naturally social beings, then in that sense, it's never really the case that we are free to do whatever we want. It is always the case that we have obligations and responsibilities to some people. All right? It is never the case that we are just simply free to, to act and do as we see fit. All right? Um, they did certainly agree about the diversity part. Right? And indeed, much of Plato's Republic is given over to managing the diversity amongst human beings in terms of their interests and abilities. But they did think that at the end of the day, you can aggregate individuals, their different abilities and their different interests in such a way as to serve the common good. But the only way to do that on their account is to put those six, six tasks at the center of human life, the ones that I outlined for you. And so in that sense, freedom is not so much the goal, although it is certainly an important matter because all things being equal, you want people to consent to the form of government under, by which they are ruled. You want people to, you want this arrangement to be good for people, make them happy. But on this, but on these Aristotelian Platonic view, as I understand it, there's really only one way to be happy and to be satisfied with your life as a human being, and that means being successful at those tasks. Right? And about that, we really have no cho choice. Right? Happiness is about getting the job done properly. And if we don't have the requisite skills and virtues that are required to do that, then we won't be happy. And so, to conclude, I think where we stand now is very much like where Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle stood some 2,400 years ago. They too stood before a kind of modernist account of things that says nature is to be understood simply in terms of matter, and there are no independently existing moral or political standards. It's all made by us. These are all socially constructed things, and we are not naturally social beings. The Platonic and Aristotelian account argument is that in fact is not true, that they have captured things that are necessary but not sufficient. The good news though is that, if I'm correct about this historical comparison, is that we stand today where Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle stood some 2,400 years ago. Now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, the founders of one of the most, in my view, productive philosophical traditions, and we stand where they stand, where they stood 2,400 years ago. Well, standing where Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle stood, philosophically speaking, it doesn't get much better than that. Thank you very much. You. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned that the uh, pre-Socratic, Aristotelian, uh, Platonic philosophers or, or I guess uh, Greeks in general just tended to be a little more modern in their thinking. Uh, and then you have Aristotle, Plato, and Socrates who bring about 
this uh, different way of thinking. Yeah. And then there's clearly a return to, or, or yeah, there's a return to this modernity of a sort. Is there, do you think a sort of trend, a an oscillation between the two throughout history? Or, and do you think it will continue, one will continually lead to the other in a cycle? Or do you think that, uh, I don't know, people just tend toward the trend of modernity and it will always seem to come back to that, or, or vice versa? Um, I, I don't know about an historical cycle. Um, but I do think, and perhaps this underlies your point, that there is an enduring attraction to the modernist account. Because after all, even on the Socratic, Platonic, Aristotelian account, what they saw about nature is indeed necessary. It may not be sufficient, but it is necessary. Right? You can't understand, you cannot get a complete account of nature without thinking about matter. Okay? And similarly, it, it's not that they thought that freedom doesn't matter, or that consent doesn't matter, or even that self-interest doesn't matter. Right? After all, they're concerned, th their view is, is that you know, morality should make you happy. Right? And, a, and, and a, a, a well-ordered political community should be something that makes your life something worthwhile, something good. Right? So as I understand it, the problem, though, is simply this. It, matter is fundamental, necessary. But there's nothing about matter that's good or bad, even on the Platonic Aristotelian account. All right? So then, what is good by nature? What, if anything, is good by nature? Now, you might say, to heck with nature. Right? We'll just do it on the basis of artificial conventions, what we make up. You know, we're free to make up our own minds, and so that's what we'll do. But you may not be interested in nature, but nature is interested in you. And in this view, nothing short of some kind of natural foundation um, is going to provide a lasting basis for morality and politics. Okay. So you're absolutely right. The, 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 the materialist view is very attractive, and it does get part of the story right. But on their view, it also leaves out something. Uh, in particular, it leaves out sort of all the distinctive capacities of you know, the objects in the world around us that cannot be understood simply in terms of the physical stuff from which they're made. Okay. Um, perhaps I might just turn to the screen here. Um, so, for, first of all, the, the, the claim about Aristotle and thinking about formal causes and material causes. There's a, a name for this um, that you may be familiar with, hylomorphism. It's one of those fake Greek words that was made up in the 19th century. Um, it just means it's the Greek word for matter, hule, and the Greek word for form, morphe, as in morphology or what have you. Um, and so one way of thinking about Aristotle's account is it's sometimes referred to as a hylomorphic account of perceptible objects. Right? And um, the, 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 one of the questions is, is, how is this connected to, say, for example, a modern understanding of biological organisms in terms of um, genetics? Right? And my view is it fits right in. Indeed, in, in a sense, that was part of the puzzle missing from Aristotle's account, is how these forms get transmitted from one biological organism to another. And it seems to me that genetics provides a mechanism by which that can be done. And it seems to me that's also another good example of how we don't think about things just in terms of the stuff they're made out of. How that stuff is organized makes, um, makes a difference. Um, oh, dear. Um, I'm sorry, there's a question here about, uh, about Camus and... Um, uh, well, he wrote something about a plague, and uh, we know something about plagues, <laughs> um, but I don't really know very much about that. Um, perhaps one comment I might make is um, these present circumstances are very interesting because, of course, as you've all probably heard, perhaps until you're almost sick of it, that we're all in this together, right? Well, on the social contract view, no, we're not. We're not all in this together. Uh, and in fact, um, if it looks like things are going south, that's a very good reason to get out. 
Because again, on the social contract view, why do I bother obeying the rules, following the laws, only to the extent that they're useful for me? Right? And Rousseau makes this point very, very nicely in his discourse on the origins of inequality, the second discourse. He says, you may have heard of this rule, love thy neighbor as thyself, right? the golden rule. Rousseau says, no, forget about it. Don't love your neighbor as yourself, love yourself. Right? Now, I don't know about you, but I find that loving myself commandment a lot easier than loving my neighbor especially as some people say, you should meet my neighbor. Right. Of course, this has to be done in an enlightened way. Selfishness on the social contract view is stupid. It's a stupid way to pursue your self-interest. People get upset with you, they throw you out of the club. Right. So by all means, be smart in your pursuit of self-interest. But it is at the end of the day about self-interest. And so if the arrangement is not being useful, then you have a perfect right to separate, to secede, to walk away. Find another club to join that's more useful to you. So in that sense, no, we're not in this together. Um, it seems to me that if you think that human beings are not naturally social animals, um, then it's never going to be the case that our interest in other human beings is going to be more than mercenary or instrumental. Um, someone asks about the same outcomes. Uh, I talked about uh, this being one of the desiderata of our current understanding. Um, I think that, and this is connected to the, the point I just made with, with, about Rousseau. So on Rousseau's account, there's no such thing as the principle of charity, or the old theological virtue of charity, right, as expressed in the, the commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself. All right. um, so. If, if I'm right that given the free individual freedom and the diversity of abilities and talents and interests, the outcome that we should expect is a tremendous diversity difference of outcomes. And, you know, let's, be, let's, let's face it, the marketplace is a cruel master. Right? Some people are rewarded enormously, other people not very much or not at all. And yet we try to correct for that. Now, fair enough. You know, we distribute wealth from the rich to the poor, and we, we feel that no one should be left behind. Right? And I agree with that too. But on what basis? And it seems to me on the, the social contract view, the only justification I have for caring about the impoverished or the vulnerable or what have you is because at the end of the day, it's going to be useful to me. So by all means, do a good turn to your neighbor Love your neighbor, but so your neighbor will be useful to you. Okay? So it's the, it's the question about why we should care about one another, why we think that at the end of the day we should try to even out the results. All right? And if you think that it's natural for us as human beings to want to even out the results and make sure that nobody gets left out, nobody gets left behind, and so on, right? then it seems to me there really is no basis for that, at least not on a lasting basis, in the social contract view. That seems to me to presuppose that we are naturally social animals. Um, dear me, I seem to have stirred up a hornet's nest. Um, Be sure to read a question. Uh, oh, yes. Um, the second problem that I raised about modernism, natural law ethics solves the problem of undecidability. Even in, with an objective natural law system of ethics, don't people still disagree as much about what's natural and so on? And to what extent is it possible even there to reach a consensus? I, I agree that the, the, let's say you adopt the view that we are naturally social animals and therefore it, in that sense it is natural for us to have laws, legislature, to try and regulate our conduct right, so that we can get these jobs done. Right? Um, I, I think I agree with the sentiment of the, of the question that's expressed here, is that you know, just saying we're naturally social beings is not going to solve all the problems. I agree. But it's more than the, the claim that's being made by Plato and Aristotle, is that it's more, than, it's more than we're just social beings. It's that our social ability is defined by those six 
tasks or jobs that we have to do. Right? And so that's what, if you will, organizes the laws. Do they, are they conducive to performing those jobs, getting those jobs done properly or not? So I think, yes, there has to be more to the notion of natural law than just human beings being naturally social. But I think they argue for, if you will, a much richer account of just what our natural sociability is going to look like, just what jobs we have to do as social beings. Um, so the, perhaps as a last question, um, would you please explicate a bit on the conscious inspiration of the, the pre-Socratic materialists gave to the Enlightenment? Um, and for an example, um, one example that I, I did have in mind was, uh, I think I mentioned that in one of his unpublished letters, Isaac Newton makes reference to the pre-Socratic atomists. And indeed, uh, in Newton's time, um, there was a great deal of interest in the pre-Socratic atomists. Um, Newton's professor at Cambridge, Isaac Barrow, who chaired the Lucasian chair uh, at, at Cambridge that, that Newton took over, was also very interested in the ancient Greek atomists. And, and indeed, there was a, a great deal of interest in ancient Greek atomism in the 16th and 17th century. And you can see what's partly what's driving this is the feeling that somehow, perhaps, the ancient Greek atomist view had not been given a fair shake, huh, the swerve, um, had not been given a fair shake, had not been given, if you will, perhaps the uh, accorded a, a just exposition. All right. Um, and so looking back to, I think there, there, there was quite a conscious looking back to that pre-Socratic materialist tradition um, in, the, in our scientific revolution, I think they recognized that there was something going on then back in the 6th and 5th century BC that was akin to what was going on in the 17th century. I, I should say, however, though, that I talk about the scientific revolution in the 17th century, but the views of modernism that I'm talking about really don't come to the fore until the end of the 18th century and from then on. There are some very important differences between the 17th and 18th century uh, in terms of their views. Um, if you think about the three central figures of the 17th century, Descartes, Leibniz, and Newton, and you compare those three with, say, three central figures of the 18th century French Enlightenment, say, compare um, Descartes to, say, Diderot, or Leibniz to Voltaire, or Newton to the French 18th century physicist Laplace, you'll see that already in that one century there was a tremendous change in their theological views and their views about the foundations of science, um, and indeed about morals. Descartes says in the third part of his Discourse on Method, if you want to know what the moral laws are that you should follow, just look at the teachings of the Catholic Church. Now compare that to Voltaire's écraser l'infâme, right, the denunciation of, of, of the Catholic Church a century later, you can start to see some of the, the differences between the 17th and the 18th century. So I, I guess the, the modernist views that I'm looking at are really the result of that reflection upon the scientific revolution, saying, oh, there's a whole other aspect of nature that we really didn't know about before, and, and we discover how tremendously powerful it is and, of course, one must grant that, that the mastery of matter has made us tremendously powerful for good and for ill. Right. Um, but then the implications of that, um, I think that got, of that 17th century scientific revolution, really it took to the end of the 18th century to kind of work out those other views that I talked about this evening. Could I ask a question about yeah. Yeah. the Jews who did not appear in your lecture, so it's a bit off but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom one can certainly see at the moment if your doctor doesn't fear the Lord and doesn't fear judgment after death you better start fearing your doctor um, God's in instructions to the Jews as to how to run the good society were very very didactic weren't they the ten divine intolerances you will not do these ten things you could write them that way Yes. But just to sort of push it in the face of modern society that tries to make a virtue out of tolerance. Yes, well, the social contract theorists are fine with the second half of the Decalogue. Yes. Right? So, uh, right, so adultery, out, uh, because that's a kind of contractual arrangement. 
uh, you know, exchange of promises, you should keep your word because it's useful, uh, theft, out, and, and so on, murder, out, you'll be happy to know. Um, but uh, my favorite commandment, being a parent, my favorite commandment from the first part of, of the Decalogue is the one, the fourth commandment if you're a Catholic, or the fifth commandment if you're a Reformed Protestant, honor thy father and thy mother. <laughs> you can see why as a parent I would like that. Um, but then there's also the reciprocal commandment for parents to look after their children. Right? And again, on the social contract view, why would you, as a parent, look after your children? Well, presumably only to the extent that they're useful to you. So, you know, the next time you see your parents, you can ask them, you know, why do you keep me around? <laughs> why are you looking after me? Right? And uh, if the response is, well, we're looking forward to your earnings, dear, um, then, then that gives you a sense of what the, f the footing is, <laughs> where you stand. But I think most of you would be rather disappointed if that were the response that you got. Right? And again, let me go back to Aristotle's discussion of friendship, because I do think this, is, this kind of makes it clearest, this notion, where you see the claim that we are naturally social beings, but also that getting that job done, being a good friend, is actually a difficult job to do. Right? And as I saw on, on their account, it requires loyalty and it requires justice. Right? Nothing like injustice to ruin a friendship and disloyalty. Right? So on Aristotle's account, it's really only virtuous people who can be friends with one another. And, but yet, human life also on their view, without friendship, really would be miserable. It would be incomplete. So if you think, as they did, that friendship is one of the crowning glories of human, human social nature and requires all those virtues and is not something we have a choice about. It's not that we say to ourselves, well, do I want friends or I don't want friends? Well, it's so much trouble, why, not, why don't I just sort of give it up? No, nobody thinks that way because I think we all realize that without friends uh, and loved ones, our lives are incomplete. So we're naturally social beings, but that's a difficult task. It involves all sorts of requirements. Um, and unless we acquire the virtues we need to get the job done right, we're not going to be happy. Did these Greeks have any view that might approximate the Christian one of the fall? Or did they think they could do it? Um, in this sense, yes. Um, without those virtues, our lives are miserable. That's where we start. We have the jobs, but we don't have the virtues. We have the jobs, we have the requirements, but we don't have the skills necessary to get the, the jo these jobs done correctly, to fulfill these tasks properly. Right? So it's like being given a homework assignment, but you don't know how to do the assignment because you haven't been taught yet the skills you need. I'm sort of trying to conjure up every student's worst nightmare here. Right? We haven't covered that yet. Right? Well, life's like that. You start off and you're given this long list of homework. And you, to begin with, you don't have the skills you need. And there's no guarantee that you ever will. Right? We are truly fortunate if we live at a time and place where we are able to acquire the education and the social support that we required, that we require in order to acquire those virtues. So we start with the job, but not with the skills we need to get it done. We've got a little bit out of order in terms of we normally could say you, thank you and then ask the questions, but could you, we didn't get around to that. Could you just go up and say goodbye there? There's about <laughs> 60 people watching, so thank yes. you for coming. All um, I'm told that uh, those of you who are watching need to know when we've come to an end. Uh, when, when you get to me, you've come to an end. But, uh, <laughs> That really was uh, an incredibly good review for us of what's going on. And you leave us with a lot of strings that are hanging out and wanting to be pulled or tied or uh, dealt with in one way or another. And uh, I hope we'll see more of you around the college and those discussions can happen. But thank you for giving up an evening to us. We have appreciated it. Thank you.